Thank you. Um, so let's welcome Haile. Uh, Haile is going to present efficient deep learning at scale. Please, Haile, if you can start sharing your screen. Um, Haile is Claire Booth Luce Professor and an Associate Chair for Operations of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Duke University. She received her uh, Bachelor and Master from Xinhua University and PhD from Purdue University. At Duke, she co-directs Duke University Center of Computational Evolutionary Intelligence and NSF IUCRC for Alternative, Sustainable and Intelligent Computing. Uh, she has award NSF Career uh, Awards. Uh, she has also DARPA John Faculty Award, um, a different fellowship from Germany and a late fellowship, uh, many different paper awards. So let's welcome Haley uh, with this great presentation. Haley, you have the platform. Sure. Uh, can you hear me and see the uh, screen sharing right now? Mm, yes, very well. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for the nice introduction as well. Uh, it's very, uh, very nice workshops and talking about energy efficiency. Um, so today I'm going to share our work related to the efficient and scalable deep learning. Um, how can I go to this page? Okay. All right, so I will start with this page. Actually, the figure over here compare various neural network accelerator designs. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight here, in fact, is the data is not the end-to-end -end compute TOPS provat, but TOPS provat if and only if the complete model fits in the memory. So in reality, the situation is worse than this. Um, so, but nevertheless, I guess the figure or the information here definitely indicates a general trend of pushing the execution speed to a dream for cloud applications. Well, energy efficiency is uh, still the primary consideration for the edge applications. So um, I guess uh, we do not have to spend a lot of time in talking about the why uh, energy efficiency is very, very important over here. My major point over here, in fact, is um, the performance of the DNN models is associated with increased model size and grown computation requirement. So here I highlight uh, the series of the ResNet. And as you can see it over here, uh, deeper network structures and can obtain better classification accuracy. And of course, the cost is more computation. And here the computation is measured by operations, right, GigaOps, as we mentioned in previous page. So what is the difficulty of uh, having larger models from inference perspective? And it's definitely going to enlong the inference uh, latencies, uh, slow down the uh, speed, and uh, more fundamentally, in fact, uh, in deploying large models on edge devices uh, is difficult, mainly because of the limitation of the compute and memory uh, on hardware uh, resources. Uh, training site and training large models is uh, slower, um, and therefore uh, the research and the production cycles can kind of uh, very, very long. So in today's talk, I'm going to uh, try to kind of uncover from both ends. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce in several topics and research uh, works in, in our group. The first one is called Deep Hire. It is a um, differentiable and skill environment sparsing sparsity inducing regularizer designs. And the goal over here is to uh, reduce the model size and therefore uh, the deployment and inference speed can be easier and faster. Penny is talking about the pruned kernel sharing. And in this work, so we're trying to combine the uh, algorithm approach uh, with a hardware re requirement. And I'm going to show that our preliminary study result over here. Agpar is in fact talking about the tensor partitioning and the here that our major focus is trying to improve the training efficiency. And at the end, of course, I can to quickly conclude uh, this talk. All right, so let's start from deep hire first. Um, deep hire actually is um, one type of the uh, sparsity inducing regularizer design for the DNNs. In fact, uh, there are a lot of previous studies and utilizing sparsity inducing regularizer 
uh, the common one like L1 and L0. Um, figure on the right-hand side actually shows the contour and the gradient direction of these two common regularizers. And as you can see, the L1 regularizer is differentiable and convex, so it is easy to optimize. However, the value of the L1 regularizer is proportional to the scale of the parameter. So it can only scale down all the elements with the same speed. And uh, it is kind of a lead to the penalty on large elements in the widths, uh, which generally speaking is not des desirable. And the, for the L0 regularizer, um, they can directly reflect the uh, sparsity by definition, and it's a skill invariant. However, if you're looking at the, uh, the gradient, it doesn't uh, provide very useful gradient. The gradient either is infinite on the x-axis or zero everywhere else. So it doesn't work directly with the gradient descent and it need additional tricks like stochastic appro approximation to be applied on the DNN pruning, uh, indicating that the optimization becomes more complicated. Um, in this work, what we propose is to move beyond L1 and L0 and find a sparsity inducing regularizer that is both differentiable and the skill invariant for DNN pruning. Um, so when we kind of start um, exploring the uh, regularizers possible, the higher regularizer draw our attention, which is represent the ratio between L1 norm and L2 norm. And uh, for the element-wise the DNN prunings, what we propose is to apply the squared version of the Hoyer regularizer, and we name it as an Hoyer square regularizer over here. So the new regularizer is differentiable and also skill invariant as what we illustrate over here. It has the same range and also similar minima structure as an L0. So the minima is achieved as uh, one, one and only one element in the weight is non-zero and the maximum is achieved as the total number of the elements uh, when uh, all the elements and have the same uh, non-zero uh, values. Okay, so it's, it's kind of over here or versus and over here. So the higher square regularizer can be considered as what we say differentiable approximation to the L0 norm, okay? And then, in fact, in this work, and we further extend the Hoyer square regularizer to the structure pruning settings. And uh, this is similar as the uh, idea of an group lessos. We apply the uh, Hoyer square regularizer over L2 norm of each group of weights, uh, which is defined as an WG over here. So the weights within the group will be induced to become zero simultaneously. Um, and we group the weights along channels and filters to induce and structure sparsity in the model. Um, so uh, when we observing the uh, gradients of the higher square regularizer with respect to uh, each element in the weight matrices, um, in fact, we can get this uh, equation representation. And uh, within this, and you may notice this in subtraction term, and this in subtraction term induces in what we call the auto training effect. So the below figure actually uh, uh, virtually illustrate this in auto training effect. X-axis uh, uh, indicating the training epochs and a Y-axis is and shows uh, you know, the change of the weight elements in during the training. Uh, different colors uh, represent uh, randomly picked the uh, uh, weight parameters over here for, uh, for illustration purposes. So as shown in the figures and um, during the optimization, the regularizer will turn weights with the small values to zero. While for those with the large values and uh, the regularizer kind of can protect them from uh, pruning. And then the trimming in threshold is in show uh, by the black dash line over here. And as you can see that the, the regularizer will gradually extend training threshold as more weights coming close to zero. So it's self-adaptive. Um, considering the time, I can quickly go over some results. 
basically for elements wise dispersity, the proposed Hoyer square regularizer can further improve model compression rate. Um, and it doesn't uh, suffer, uh, sacrifice the accuracy loss. And uh, if you're looking at the, the layer wise the compression provide over here, the higher square regularizer is especially effective for, for compressing large uh, fully connect layer, uh, which often are uh, most uh, many, many, uh, memory intensive layers in the deep model. Um, we actually, uh, for the structure sparsity side, we actually test uh, uh, our group higher square regularizer on compressing ResNet models for Sephir 10 and also ImageNet. Um, as you can see with those in curves, it's achieved the best trade-off between accuracy uh, and also the number of the flops. The trade-off points achieved by our method um, kind of uh, afterperforms the uh, Pareto frontier compared with the, the previous methodologies, meaning um, we have less flops and higher accuracy uh, simultaneously. So, uh, so far, I kind of briefly introduced in deep how your works. A lot of the details, in fact, can be found uh, in our paper. Um, my next example is in Penny, the pruned kernel sharing. So over here, our approach is different. Um, in fact, in today's workshops, a lot of compression methodologies uh, were discussed, including quantization, uh, some model uh, redesigns, uh, pruning methodologies like unstructured prunings uh, and also uh, structured prunings. So basically, um, the uh, method of the penny will focus on uh, decomposition, like using low rank approximations over here. So low rank approximation utilize the matrix factorization and then decompose, decompose weight matrices into the product of two low rank matrices and therefore reduce the computation cost. Uh, we can see that the speed up and parameter reduction of a low rank approximation are pretty notable. However, um, uh, you know, how to combine the low rank, uh, 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 low rank approximation with the existing other method, for instance, the pruning is still not uh, solved. And the work over here kind of target this domain. So, um, in this work, um, uh, uh, especially we are targeted in CNN model compression frameworks, and we tend to uh, kind of provide uh, methodologies to decompose layer parameters into tiny set of um, what we call the basis kernels and accompany coefficient matrices. Okay. Uh, in fact, on this page, uh, we give an overview of the penny. There are four phases in the proposed framework. Uh, the first step uh, is called the uh, kernel decomposition. Uh, the step in these steps, we tend to decompose filters into uh, the uh, dimension basis and uh, uh, corresponding to the coefficient uh, matrices. So the second step is used to recover the model performance by alternatively training basis and coefficient. Uh, and uh, in fact, in the steps, and we tend to integrate with the sparsity regularization and particularly applies to the coefficients, okay, to reduce the uh, size of the coefficients in that matrices. And then the last step we call the model shrinking. Uh, the goal over here is tend to explore the structure redundancy and therefore further uh, shrink the model. I will give a quick uh, introduction on those uh, steps. Um, in fact, the kernel decomposition is the most complicated uh, stage during this uh, methodology. So as you can see, um, here we illustrate in future tensors uh, with the size of an KL by KL kernel size. Uh, input feature uh, map number is in CL and output feature map number is in CL, uh, CL plus one. So we first enroll along the input and output channel dimensions and made up in uh, weight matrices. And um, the dimension of uh, each row is in KL uh, square and their CL times and CL plus one entries over here. 
So based on this and we matrix W, we can uh, start the SVD decompositions, okay? And during the decompositions, we could choose the first K column uh, vectors from like U and form the basis matrices over here. And then for the remaining, then we project the original kernel with U and U transpose to form the coefficient matrix illustrated over here. Okay. So the next steps and the basis is the kernels are shared, um, are kind of reformed through the basis matrices, and they will be shared across all the input channels. Um, this will eventually produce in K intermediate feature maps. And the, the coefficient matrix will be restored as what we call the coefficient, uh, 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 again, it's a kind of a matrix or kernel over here. Okay, and those feature maps are combined with the sparse uh, coefficients. So in fact, in practice, we observe the particularly the sparsity of the coefficient matrix is very, very high. So in the following uh, steps in B, we tend to restore to the original 40 tensor during the trainings. And again, in step B, then we alternately train the basis kernel and coefficiency in trying to uh, recover the accuracy loss. Um, and when we're doing this, we apply L1 regularization to the coefficient over here. And the, during this, and we apply magnitude-based prunings and remove and those uh, less important weights and it further improve the uh, sparsity of the coefficiencies. Okay. Um, so in fact, uh, in this step, and the uh, specification requirement is low, and in fact, we do not require any structure uh, pruning uh, over here, and I will explain why. Okay, the step D is what we call the model uh, shrinking. Okay, model shrinking begins with the reshape the coefficient matrices into uh, uh, you know the shape corresponding to the upper layers versus the shape. Uh, corresponding to uh, sorry upper layers and versus the input layers. So here is the upper layer from uh, you know uh, uh, after entry from layer L, and here the blue indicating the input entry for the next layer L uh, plus one. Okay. Um, so by selecting the first dimensions like the input channel and summing the output of the non-zero elements of the remaining two dimensions, and we have an, this part. And then uh, similarly, we can kind of get into two parts. So as you can see, like when we have data, uh, go to L, uh, layer L and go to uh, layer L plus ones, okay? Um, the white color over here indicating zeroed uh, entries. And the, no matter there's a zero on um, this and orange colored layers or the blue colored layers, as far as then there is any a kind of a zeros, in fact, uh, the folding operation is not necessary. Therefore, by kind of a comparing the two entries, and we can further improve the uh, specification. Okay, so such kind of a redundancy in the basis uh, kernels and can also be derived with the same procedure. So due to the time constraints, I won't talk too much over here. So. Um, I would like to uh, quickly compare diver kernel decomposition with, for example, the previous work talking about the future uh, decomposition. The future decomposition um, also use low rank assumption. Uh, what does it do actually is to obtain D futures and then uh, go to C L plus one, one by one, uh, uh, by by D filters. So as you can see, when we execute it and through hardware, and this in fact uh, requires in two stage matrices multiplications, and the more particularly the output from the first uh, the kind of an intermediate output from the first steps and need to be stored and therefore sent to the second a step. And therefore, uh, you know, when we have a multiple matrix operations, it's essentially in long or potentially in long the execution time. So other cases, um, in fact, uh, what we have in K kernels, um, the number of the K is a lot of smaller than the original D. Um, and the, the, this is in part of the matrix operation uh, or convolution uh, computations. However, uh, as I illustrated on the previous page on this, and 
model shrinking steps. And um, for the coefficiency operations, in fact, it goes to the same gating structures. So uh, this uh, can be uh, streamed through the accumulation along the output dimensions and doesn't have to stop over here. The execution, in fact, is a lot of faster and easier. Um, we actually conducted experiments on Cephal 10 and also ImageNet. Um, so with a very small accuracy loss, we are able to reduce the fault number significantly as we showed over here. Um, in fact, uh, um, the methodology can um, uh, gain on general purpose and platforms and as we can dramatically reduce the uh, memory consumptions uh, compared to the uh, pending with the baseline. In fact, the effective for the methodologies heavily rely on the number of the basis uh, kernels. And of course, in the number of the kernels is going to affect the accuracy as well. So the two figures actually show uh, the relations in between or the trade-offs between the computation resource and the accuracy. Uh, again, a more details and can uh, refer our paper and the code online. So my next topic uh, will be uh, talking about the tensor partition, and this work is uh, primarily focusing on how to improve the training efficiency. Well, uh, so in this work, um, we know right now on hardware domains and people tend to develop, uh, integrate a lot of accelerators on chip and uh, tend to improve uh, uh, inference operations. So. Our primary goals in this work is to accelerate deep learning training with the hardware with the, a lot of accelerators. Okay, so common practice is doing uh, kind of a uh, model partition or data partitions. Uh, what we're curious is and, uh, for the heterogeneous accelerators and how can we better explore the full computation potentials. So in this work, we focus on the tensor. And here we denote the tensor with the shape, same shape by one symbol for simplification. So as you can see on this page, we're talking about the training processes, uh, forward path, basically the output uh, feature map uh, is the re, uh, is the uh, it can be obtained through the multiplication of the input feature map with the weight matrices. And the backward, the error can be calculated and through the error of the next from the next stage and uh, uh, together with the weight matrix transpose, right? So similarly, we have the grading calculation illustrated over here. And uh, based on the tensor definition I just gave over here, this can be simplified with the three types of tensors, A and B and Cs, uh, purely defined by the same shape of uh, uh, by symbols. All right, so what does that mean in, in our methodologies? So we're talking about uh, tend to partition um, a matrix matrix multiplications in two different accelerators and for instance, in two of here. So originally a row of matrix A together in a column of matrix B will produce in one entry at the upper C. So when we uh, partition them into two accelerators. So one way to do this is uh, allocate an alpha portion of the row and the uh, column of the Bs into one accelerator, right? And the remaining is to another accelerator. So the two accelerators and each going to produce a partial uh, submission results. And at the end, we need to kind of sum them all together. So in fact, during the uh, training processes, and if we're looking at those um, basic partitions uh, and assuming like we're going to partition and distribute them into multiple uh, accelerators, this is going to bring us in three types of um, partition methodologies. Uh, the first one is based on the gradients. Uh, the second is based on the forward and third one is based on the backward. In fact, uh, uh, you know, if you are looking at the forward cases, and this is exactly follow what we have in, in the previous page. So um, this is basically seeing like we have in such partitions and uh, what's going on in the following operations, okay? Well, what does it indicate? So in fact, when we do this in partitions, it's going to affect 
the computation cost and also communication cost. So here, the computation cost is defined as the total number of the flops for the internal multiplications and divided by the computation power of an accelerator, right? And the communication cost is a little bit more complicated. It's related to the interlayer cost and interlayer cost. So interlayer cost is the cost for the par partitional partial sum accumulations as I showed on the previous two pages. Um, but here, I guess and one critical thing is we uh, affect the training effect uh, we, we say is an interlayer cost. So for example, if we consider layer L, we apply type two partition and layer L1, we also apply type two uh, partition. So meaning the output feature map from the layer one will be used and sent as the input feature maps. So on the forward path, right, we produce and partition, uh, sorry, partial submissions on each accelerators. They have to be summed together and then, uh, you know, uh, a partition and uh, shared by multiple accelerators and for the layer uh, L plus one. So on the, uh, you know, uh, back propagation path, in fact, uh, each accelerator in blues can only contribute a partial of this and error matrices. So uh, indicating that we have to integrate all informations and distribute it through uh, so many accelerators. And this actually, uh, you know, uh, what we find is that when we have uh, different combinations, they're going to cost in different uh, interlayer communication patterns. Okay, and this is an uh, uh, build our analysis foundation for like interlayer communication patterns. Uh, I wouldn't talk to details and because um, it's it's not too complicated. It's just a, a lot of the variations. So during the layer wise partitions and to determine each layer and how can we com uh, configure with the type one, two or threes, we apply dynamic programming approach starting from the front to the back and then uh, to the end and then a back proper gate to determine like for each layers and which type will be the most problem uh, optimal solutions in order to optimize the minimize the total partitional cost. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, I didn't illustrate over here, so, but you can imagine uh, the accelerators and uh, hardwares are arranged in a kind of a grid structures. So to extend the partition from two accelerators into many of the accelerators, we use in hierarchical partitions. And uh, in this process is and we recursively portion on two accelerator in groups and eventually obtain the final design. Um, so in this work, in fact, we evaluate and compare uh, the methodology on uh, heterogeneous accelerators um, with the previous in designs. DP over here represent the data parallelism and the uh, OWT, uh, in fact, is an, uh, I forgot what's the full name, but what does it have? It's either uh, data parallelism or model parallelism are applied over here, uh, oh, one weird trick. And then um, hyper is in kind of an half and uh, 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 data parallelism and the model parallelism, but uh, it's only considered the same two partitions. Um, and in fact, uh, they're corresponding to the type one and type twos in figure one, respectively. So um, we I evaluate- Five minutes. Sure. So in fact, we evaluate on the heterogeneous and setups and also homo homogeneous and setups and by considering uh, you know, uh, different type or the same types of the uh, TPUs. So, uh, I mean, with the figures, it's definitely show that uh, it's uh, have a uh, better uh, performance. Um, yeah, it has a, a better uh, performance. And even if it's based on just a more systematic approach to explore the partition space, um, in fact, they can find kind of optimal solutions. Um, we actually, um, I mean, this result is based on the homogeneous accelerators, and, but what I really wanted to talk in fact is in the figure on the right hand side. This is in the final uh, exportation type configurations. So in the three fully connect layers and FC1 and two and threes, as you can see, type two and the threes are used to minimize communication. 
uh, by basically partitioning a part of the weights locally and then communicating the feature maps. For convolutional layers, we can see that type one partition are mostly but not solely selected, meaning for, for example, for convolution three, in fact, that most of them are type ones, but type two and the threes are also used. Um, so Occupy allows, in fact, the mixture selection of uh, different types and therefore it can have a uh, very top level uh, holistic uh, optimizations. And especially with the increase of the hierarchy levels, more layer uh, will be configured with the type two and the trees. And this illustrates the importance of an, uh, having a complete search space in uh, Aquapar. So in here, the presentation, I only talk about the basic design concept in layer partitions, um, but in our implementation and explorations, and we find that there are many other tricks, such as in how can we handle multiple path cases in uh, DNN designs, and uh, uh, you know how to determine the partition ratios, uh, like utilizing how many uh, accelerators and for each layers. And those details, again, can be found in our paper. So at the end, uh, let me quickly uh, conclude the uh, talk. Basically, what we feel like uh, efficiency uh, uh, scalability, I didn't mention about the robustness in this talk, but we believe and those are all very important in the end model development and also uh, deployment. So for inference operations, and uh, we are seeking for training and hardware friendly methodologies for uh, high compression and also in order to maximize the benefit of the general purpose and software hardware platforms. Um, so the approach over here is in kind of integrate algorithm architecture and also combine uh, methodologies. Uh, for trainings and I guess in, uh, training efficiency in how to combine with the robustness and, um, and uh, furthermore, and how to pass those informations and to have a better model selections and this uh, will be directions that we will continue work on. So this is actually conclude my talk and thank you very much and for being here and I'm, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Haile. Oh, this was a great talk. Um, so if anybody has a question, please raise their hands. Well, we are waiting for the questions. I have one question. Um, it seems that there is different approaches that you are you're showing today, and one of them is Penny, and there are different phases on Penny. Uh, you highlighted that the first phase, which is this kernel decomposition, it's quite important and could affect highly the accuracy, and then you do retraining. And then after retraining, there is a, a pruning phase that probably is dropping the accuracy again. What are your intuitions that how is that phase is affecting different models? from CNNs to RNNs to transformer? Do you think different phases affect in different ways each model? Or what is your intuition in that sense? So, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, this is our work, first uh, exploration along those methodologies. And so, so far, we only explored a CNN and published this. And uh, we do believe in uh, this is going to affect differently in other methodologies. And for example, RN, so transformer you mentioned, uh, particularly RNNs, and there's an, a higher constraint in terms of the layer structures and uh, 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 basically the first uh, is kind of correlated to the second uh, configurations. So uh, according to our previous and pruning methodology designs, we kind of feel like the uh, space, uh, we could have, an, uh, I mean, the pruning space or the compression space for the RNs could be smaller than this, and the, the design could be more sensitive uh, compared to the uh, CN-based methodologies. Um, but this is, again, this is my intuitive guess, and we need uh, further experiments and to uh, approve it. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there any other questions? Uh, Satya? Um, I was wondering, since you talked about matrix multiplications and uh, tensors, how do some of these techniques apply to the upcoming uh, kind of architectures like graph neural networks? Mm. This is also a very good question. And, 
Uh, for the tensor partitions, and right now the exploration again is for the DNA models. We actually started exploring on the uh, graph partition as well. Um, I guess in the focus over here is a little bit different. For the graph partitions, I guess in, uh, the sparse connection uh, is the most challenging perspectives. Um, so we, instead of an handle uh, fixed patterns and during this and trainings and um, you know, in the graphics uh, situation or the applications. And we have to also include this in connection, the impact of the dynamic connections and how going to affect it, the, uh, like a training and inference or uh, uh, procedures. So this made the things uh, more challenging and, but also uh, interesting. Sure, thanks. Is there any other questions? Well, let's thank again, Haley, for the presentation. Great talk. Thank you, Haley.